Okay, so th thank you everyone for attending this course. So the main aim, the main goal of the course is to give you just an introduction to the main ethical issues arising from research on consciousness and cognition. And the specific focus will be, of course, patients with disorders of consciousness. So very briefly, um, the, the, the outline of the course, we will provide a couple of presentations. Uh, the first uh, will be by me and the second one by Benedetta, who I, thanks very, I thank very much. And Benedetta uh, will describe more in detail her background, very short. He, she is a philosopher, but also a cognitive neuroscientist, right? So she has uh, this double uh, background and she is an expert in the clinical treatment of patients with disorders of consciousness. From my side, I am a philosopher and neuroethicist, so my background is theoretical, and I am working within the HPP uh, since 2013, uh, so <laughs> since the beginning, and I've been dealing with ethical issues arising from research on consciousness, specifically on disorders of consciousness, and lately also about issues arising from artificial intelligence. So we can start with my presentation. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay, so uh, this course will be about the neuroethical reflection about consciousness and cognition in the clinical context. And so I will provide you a very brief introduction about two specific points of view, which are the foundational and the practical issue. And um, about the practical issue, we have also the presentation by Benedetta Cecconi, which will be more specifically about the clinical assessment of residual consciousness in patients with disorders of consciousness. And then we, we have one case study that hopefully will help us to, to discuss about what we have been presented. So uh, there is, um, as I, as I already mentioned to you, there is a possible approach to the ethical issues arising from the assessment of consciousness in disorders of consciousness. And these are the foundational and the practical analysis. And I will say you something more in a moment. Uh, I will also introduce uh, a model for detecting and handling the ethical issues arising from disorders of consciousness. Uh, because one of the priority in, in this kind of discussion is, of course, to identify the issues, but also to set the priorities in order to concretely uh, act in the clinical context. So we need an operational model, and I have an idea about that. And then we, I will also illustrate relevant work that we have been doing within the work package number two of the Human Brain Project. So uh, why this kind of course? Well, the ethical uh, discussion around the issues uh, arising from consciousness research uh, is really uh, a priority, is really important because we have so many uh, different kinds of issues arising from this kind of research. And is, these issues are really affecting the, qu the quality of care provided to affected patients in the clinics. So it's really key to focus our attention on the ethical sides of, of this kind of research, especially when we talk about disorders of consciousness. We have so many issues and the more research uh, goes on, advances, and the more we have uh, you know, to, to, to analyze arising ethical issues. Importantly, we need a multidisciplinary approach and also, as I already told you, a clear action model. We need to, to discuss together, um, collaborating uh, between different uh, expertise, different people coming from different fields. This is really key in order to succeed in, in the analysis and the assessment of these issues. 
So we will have um, a theoretical and ethical analysis. This is um, a main uh, feature of the kind of work I've been doing within the HPP. Uh, always try to combine a more philosophical, more conceptual approach and a more practical ethical analysis. Uh, but it's also important, of course, to include an, a clinical analysis, and Benedetta will help us on this. And also we will have a case study uh, as a starting point for the general discussion. So let's go into the matter, so to say. So narratives of consciousness and cognition. The first point that I think is important to highlight is that our knowledge of consciousness is inferential, which means probabilistic. In philosophy, we have the other mind problem, uh, which basically says that we cannot really access, directly access the mind, so the experience, the personal experience of other people in front of us. So uh, we can have all, only an indirect knowledge of their level of consciousness and the kind of experience they are actually living. Um, this implies that uh, we are uncertain, we are always uncertain about the kind and the level of consciousness of the, of the people in front of, our, of us. This is true in general, I mean also with healthy people, and is especially true with people uh, with brain, uh, important brain damage. So people unable to behaviorally communicate like people in disorders of consciousness, people in vegetative state, for instance, or people in minimally conscious states, people that are unable to communicate, so to say, normally with the external world. This uncertainty raises an ethical concern, especially in condition where we need to take decision about these patients. We need to take, you know, decision about the treatment or also end of life decisions. So, I mean, more or less um, a big decision about how to treat these patients. I would suggest you this recent book, The Ethics of Uncertainty, which is specifically about the ethical implication of this kind of uncertainty or inferential knowledge we have about the level and kind of consciousness of these patients. Um, I've been also dealing with this kind of issue recently, and this is a paper we have published uh, three years ago, or almost three years, yeah, three years ago. And this paper was about the, the indicators of consciousness, meaning features that can help us in order to quantify, identify the consciousness of people, um, in the disorders of consciousness, but actually our analysis was broader, and so we were also referring to animals, so non-human animals, and also to artificial machines. So the problem, the, uh, the challenge, is to identify characteristics that can facilitate the attribution of consciousness to other agents, human, non-human, and also non-biological agents. More specifically, we started from the identification of some features of consciousness, um, more specifically dynamics and stability, meaning that our conscious experience is dynamic, changes in time, but is also stable. So we have a combination of these two apparently um, contradictory um, features. Our consciousness is also intentional, so intentionality is another feature of consciousness. Uh, basically, intentionality means that in our conscious experience we uh, refer to something, you know, um, different than, you know, uh, our brain, so uh, we have directed to something our experience is also integrated, is characterized by uh, a specific 
the situation that we are living and also by a qualitative richness. Uh, there is no time to go into the details. I invite you to take a look at the paper if you are interested or to raise any question later on. Anyway, starting from this feature of consciousness, we introduce some indicators, some features that can help us to identify the level and the kind of experience. Brain anatomy and physiology, for instance, because <clears throat> from studies on animals and on healthy subjects, we have identified some neuronal markers, so to say, of consciousness particularly in the thalamocortical system. And so we know that some structures and some functionalities are linked to conscious experiences. And so uh, it's a legitimate inference to uh, start from the presence and the function of these structures to then conclude that the subject is having some conscious experiences. But also behaviorally, if we uh, can see a goal-directed behavior, meaning uh, a behavior finalized to a specific goal on the basis of the awareness that acting in a specific way is functional to get a specific you know, result, then we are um, uh, justified in inferring the presence of consciousness in the subject and also other indicators uh, like illusion and multi-stable perception, visual spatial behavior, episodic memory, and psychometrics and metacognitive judgment. Again, there is no time to go into the details, but this is an illustration of the kind of approach we can think about in order to assess the problem of attributing and identifying consciousness in other subjects. And more recently, we have um, developed that uh, kind of uh, research in a more ethical direction, meaning that we have started from that um, kind of analysis to then explore the possible implications at the ethical level, with specific focus on <clears throat> disorders of consciousness. And we think that this approach is potentially fruitful in order to advance in the identification and a, a, more, um, a more balanced assessment of consciousness in these patients. <clears throat> this is um, a kind of foundational issue. I forgot to clarify this point. Foundational meaning that these kind of issues impact the way we think what is good and what is bad. So in this sense, it's more foundational or fundamental because it has to do with the very ground of our ethical reasoning. Again, it impacts, it can impact how we think what is good and what is bad, okay? So this is the basic meaning of foundational issues. Another illustration is what we have labeled as the ethical relevance of the unconscious. This is an interesting point because usually in the ethical discussion around disorders of consciousness, uh, I mean, understandably, the, the, the main focus is on the residual awareness of these patients. And so we try to analyze the possible implication of treatment, um, in, I mean, with reference to the residual experience, conscious experience, I mean, of these patients. In this paper, we problematize this approach, not because it is wrong, but because it is limited. Um, it is limited in the light of recent result about the cognitive unconscious, which basically um, show that um, many activities we are able to do at the conscious level can be done also at the unconscious level. So basically, in, in a nutshell, the ethical relevance of consciousness is usually justified on the basis of two abilities, experiencing well-being and having interest. 
With ethical relevance, I mean the fact that consciousness deserves an ethical attention, an ethical discussion. So relevance is not used as synonymous of significance or value. Relevance is used in the very minimal meaning of deserving attention, so deserving analysis, so to say. So I'm neutral in terms of attributing a specific value. And so, again, the ethical relevance of consciousness is usually justified on the basis of these two abilities, experiencing well-being and having interest. Well-being can be defined as the positive effect related to what makes life good. So necessary and sufficient condition for this ability is the ability to experience the life positiveness. So basically to have an experience. Now, this concept of having an experience can be, uh, I mean, um, a priori identify with consciousness, but this is not a necessity. Uh, I mean, experience can also be extended to the unconscious level. And so we can legitimately talk about an unconscious experience. And so in this sense, an unconscious form of well-being. Having an interest can be very basically defined as having a stake in something that can potentially affect what makes our life good. And the life is good if the subject is able to attribute value to the experience and also is the subject as the capacity for interact in a meaningful way with other people. Both this capacity attributing value, which basically means to set priorities among experiences and meaningfully interact with the external, um, can be also developed uh, at an unconscious level. So they do not necessarily involve a conscious experience. And this point is crucial in order to, again, problematize the usual focus only on the conscious, the, the residual conscious experiences of patients with disorders of conscious. Again, I'm not saying that this focus is wrong. I'm just saying that it is potentially incomplete and needing a uh, you know, to be complemented with this uh, focus on the residual unconscious ability, basically because if consciousness is ethically relevant in the light of what it, it can do, uh, so more specifically, well-being and having interest, and these, uh, I mean, car, uh, these experiences, these abilities can be um, made, uh, you know, possible also by the unconscious that the inference, the legitimate philosophical inference is that also the unconscious is ethically relevant. Again, with relevance, I mean that it should be taken into consideration in making decision about patients with disorders of consciousness. I'm not saying that the unconscious is more important than the conscious level. <clears throat> I'm just saying that we should enlarge our scope, so have a broader view on the residual abilities of these patients, considering not only the residual conscious abilities, but also the residual unconscious abilities. How to do that? Well, that's an open issue and it's impossible, I mean, to, to provide a final answer to that. So indicators of consciousness and the ethical relevance of the unconscious were both illustrations of foundational issues. Now let's uh, take a look at more practical issues, meaning issues that impact the way we manage, we treat these patients. Of course, this uh, analysis is uh, selective. Uh, this is a necessity given the limited space we have. And I want to mention five um, pro possible practical issues arising from disorders of consciousness. The first is the misdiagnosis of these patients, which is still an, a, a very important issue. 
then the need for a gold standard in detecting consciousness and related disorders, the need for a refined taxonomy or description or technical speaking nosology of disorders of consciousness, then the translational need, which means the necessity we have to better translate research into clinics, and then the involvement of caregivers. So concerning the misdiagnosis, um, there are um, studies out there that quantify in around 40% uh, of mis the rate of misdiagnosis of patients in uh, vegetative state while they are actually in minimally conscious state or anyway in conditions uh, we might say better than vegetative state. These are uh, rates really impressive that raise, of course, ethical issues. Um, recently, both European and American guidelines on disorders of consciousness uh, agree in um, recommending the combination of two basic assessments of residual consciousness, which are behavioral and instrumental. I won't say very much about this because Benedetta will explain much better what we mean by these two approaches and what are the, their characteristics. And the, 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 the point that I would like to uh, focus on is how much feasible is the combination of behavioral and instrumental assessment in the clinical context. These are the two guidelines I was referring to. So the European is from the European Academy of Neurology. And the second, the American, is uh, from the um, <clears throat> Uh, the American Academy of Neurology in collaboration with the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine and the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. In a recent uh, commentary about these guidelines, I raised this issue. The fact that the instrumental assessment is not that easy, it often requires um, I mean, significant levels of expertise, the abilities to use the right, uh, you know, um, the right instruments. And also it requires the availability of um, instruments that not all ordinary uh, clinical settings have. So it's important, uh, you know, to, to, to think about how to concretely combine behavioral and instrumental assessment. How to do that? Uh, that's an open, an open issue. There are different hypotheses. We can maybe discuss a bit about them in later in the general discussion, but the, the issue is still open to, for a final solution. Another practical issue I wanted to briefly mention is the need for a gold standard, which means kind of reference point, a reference uh, in the classification of consciousness in patients with disorders of consciousness. The ethical problem arises when we take the healthy condition as the reference point, because we might fail to detect the residual consciousness in these patients, because simply because their residual consciousness might be too different from the healthy consciousness. And so we might fail in detecting their residual uh, conscious experience. This is also a philosophical problem, if you want, because we are not sure and we cannot actually know directly what kind of conscious experience, if any, is going on in the brain of patients with, uh, you know, uh, important brain damage. We cannot directly experience their experience, their conscious experience. And so if we take the healthy condition as a reference, we might fail in detecting the residual experience in this subject. And so this raises an ethical concept, of course. 
Another point I wanted to mention is the nosology. Uh, actually, uh, recent research um, is showing that two dichotomic and binary distinctions are actually insufficient to account for the graded conditions characterizing these disorders of consciousness. The point is that the, these disorders of consciousness are also relatively dynamic, so they can change over time. We can have, you know, um, very plastic conditions, and so we should avoid the risk to, uh, to, to think that these conditions are static, and so uh, there is no room for change. This may lead to what has been defined as um, therapeutic nihilism, which is an important ethical concern. When we think that uh, a subject is, so to say, with no hope of recovery, while there can be some residual possibility of recovery. But again, this is also a clinical issue, and it of course, deserves specific attention and specific analysis from a clinical point of view. There is also the translational need I mentioned, the fact that there is still a significant gap between research on disorders of consciousness and astonishing progresses have been uh, obtained in the last years. But these progresses are not always that easy to translate in actual, ordinary clinical practice. So the open problem is how to bridge the research level and the clinical practice level. There are, of course, different possibilities. Um, I would like to mention, for instance, uh, the use of research infrastructure like um, eBrain, open access research infrastructure like eBrains. eBrains is a research infrastructure that will be, you know, the legacy of the HPP or the Human Brain Project. So these kind of uh, infrastructures can facilitate to bridge the gap between researchers on one side and clinicians on the other side. So this is a possibility to explore for, you know, eventually have better clinical um, practice, a better clinical treatment of these patients. Another point that uh, has been raised is the need for a better involvement of caregivers' needs in the clinical treatment of patients with disorders of conscience. We are collaborating with some as patients' associations and foundations, and what they highlight is that very often um, the focus is uh, only on the patient's needs, patient's well-being, while, for instance, their family's needs and well-being are not taken into account. But the this, the, you know, the tragic condition of these patients has, of course, necessary and important impact also on their families. And it's important to uh, acknowledge and try to give visibility to, to these needs because in the end, the, the, the well-being of families and caregivers impact also on the well-being of the patients. So even in this case, we need a broader view. We need to enlarge the scope in order to provide, in the end, a better you know, treatment, a better uh, clinical assistance to these patients. OK, uh, so I mentioned to you that I, I had an idea about the possible operation on ethical model for a better detection and assessment of these and potentially also other ethical issues. The basic question I started from in thinking about this possible model is who is responsible for what? So the main focus is on responsibility because I think it is crucial to clearly identify um, who should do what at different levels of the organization, so to say, because 
providing healthcare to these patients is a complex, of course, effort. And it is a multi-level effort that has different actors, different agents involved. So it is crucial to identify who should do what at what level of this, uh, so to say, organization of this structure. I leveled, I named this model distributed responsibility model because basically I think that the responsibility to provide a better, you know, in the end to provide a better clinical assistance to these patients can be framed uh, in relation to three basic levels, which are the institutional, the clinical and the interpersonal level. I will say something more specific about them in a moment, but um, I want first of all clarify that these different levels are distinguished, but they are not separated. They are, of course, interconnected, and there are, of course, um, intrinsic connections, intrinsic relationship between the different levels. We cannot really separate them. In, in reality, the, the distinction is for the sake of analysis, so to say. <clears throat> so let's say a word about each level. The institutional level refers basically to who is in charge of uh, setting, for instance, the standards, the general standards of both research and healthcare. So say, uh, associations, foundations, um, professional, basically professional body, institutional bodies, uh, but can be also, uh, let's say, hospitals management. I mean, um, the level of um, super individual, so to say, uh, organization and uh, responsibility, the institutional issues and responsibility refer mainly to resources that can be financial, but also uh, in terms of, um, I mean, human resources. And also this kind of responsibility refers to the standards <clears throat> of research and healthcare provided, but also these levels it refers to setting the criteria for noso nosology, so the description of this patient specifically, and also setting the right conditions for the best possible families counseling. These are selected you know, illustrations of institutional issues and responsibility. So we have this institutional level, we have also a clinical level, which more specifically refers to the clinical work. So to clinicians working at the bedside. Um, and more specifically, uh, again, as illustrations, we can refer to the precautionary approach in the specific case of disorders of consciousness, this, meaning, this means that the lack of evidence of consciousness is not, is not an evidence, I mean, of the lack of consciousness in the sense that we need always to be cautious in inferring the absence of consciousness from the absence of uh, uh, you know, evidence for it. <clears throat> so it's important to, 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 to keep, you know, uh, being cautious on this. Also, uh, another illustration is the need for a multimodal assessment. I mentioned that both European and American guidelines recommend to combine behavioral and instrumental assessment of residual consciousness, and also the need for a better communication with uh, patients' representatives, including patients' families. So these are illustration of issues and responsibility arising at the clinical level, meaning at the level of clinicians working with these patients. Finally, there is the interpersonal level, which basically means the issues arising at the direct you know, level of the interaction between uh, the clinicians and the patients. 
And as, a, as an illustration, I mentioned the medical decision making concern in the patient's treatment. This is a huge, a huge uh, point. Uh, and I think it deserves a specific analysis. Anyway, uh, again, these different levels are distinguished but not separated because uh, no none of the issue I um, introduce can be assessed only at one level. We need a combination of the different levels and combination in this case of different responsibilities. But it is also crucial to identify who is, so to say, directly and more responsible for what. So this is the goal of this, you know, distinguishing these different levels of responsibility. So this, in a nutshell, is the distributed responsibility model, which I propose as a possible tool to advance in a more concrete and pragmatic identification and assessment of the ethical issues arising from disorders of consciousness. The last point of my presentation is a brief uh, description of the work we have been doing within the work package number two in the Human Brain Project. This is a poster where we summarize a light paper which is um, in progress. Light paper is so defined because um, it will be published as a scientific paper, but it will be also connected to material that can be accessed online on eBrains, on the research infrastructure that I mentioned with you. So we'll, we'll upload different kinds of data because this is um, a multidisciplinary paper. We are philosophers, ethicists, clinicians, cognitive neuroscientists, computational neuroscientists, all together writing and thinking about how to improve the diagnosis of disorders of consciousness. And so we will have different perspectives on the issue. And we will upload on eBrains, for instance, recommendations for clinicians, but also flowcharts on how to better identify residual consciousness in these patients. And we will also upload relevant data um, registered, you know, um, at the collected at the bedside of these patients. So this is an illustration of the kind of multidisciplinary and multi-perspective. Uh, research that I think is crucial in order to advance in the identification and assessment of these issues. Okay, this is the case study, but now I stop my presentation and I give the floor to Benedetta. Okay, so yeah, thanks a lot, Michele, for the really nice introduction. Um, so today I'd like to give you a brief overview on how we assess consciousness in clinical practice. Um, so as Michele said, uh, if you want to tackle consciousness and disorders of consciousness, um, you really need to combine different expertise. So at the Coma Science Group, the, the lab in which I work, we, um, we bring together different competences. So we have physicians, we have neuropsychologists, engineers, computer scientists, biologists, physical therapists, speech therapists, and nurses, with the overall goal um, of understanding how consciousness and specifically disorders of consciousness arise in the brain. Um, so different etiologies can lead to, disorder, to a disorder of consciousness. One of the most common one is traumatic brain injury, um, anoxia, um, inter, inter um, hemispheric hemorrhage or uh, cardiac arrest and so on and so forth are also other common causes leading to uh, DOC, so to a disorders of consciousness. So after the um, adverse event, um, patients usually might transition into a comatose state. So coma patients, um, they are unaware, so they only show reflex behaviors, um, and they're also unaroused. So their eyes are closed and they do not show any sign of, um, of arousal. 
um, coma patients might um, in turn transition into what was before called the vegetative state and now has, has been renamed in um, unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. So vegetative state and responsive wakefulness syndrome patients, they recover arousal. So their eyes are um, open and they also recover sleep-wake um, cycles. Uh, yet they are completely unaware. So they only show reflex behaviors. Um, UWS patients might um, eventually transition into a minimally conscious state. Uh, minimally conscious state patients, they recover some um, sign, uh, some behavioral sign of consciousness. Um, so some cognitive be mediated behaviors. And based on the, um, on the complexity of these displayed cognitive mediated behaviors, they are um, further differentiated into two subcategories. MCS plus patients and MCS minus patients. So MCS plus patients, they retain language functions. So meaning that, for example, if I ask them to squeeze my hand, um, they will squeeze it. Um, on the contrary, MCS minus patients, they do not retain language functions. Um, but they um, not unless show some lower cognitive mediated behaviors, such as visual pursuit. So visual pursuit means that um, if you place an object, let's say a mirror in front of the patient's face, and then you move the mirror, let's say like this, the patient will, will follow with his or her eyes um, the object you're moving in front of him or her. Um, and eventually minimally conscious state patients can uh, emerge from the minimally conscious state when they recover functional communication and or functional use of objects. Um, Locked-in syndrome patients um, is a condition related to DOC, but it's not a DOC condition, even if it is often misdiagnosed as DOC. So locked-in syndrome patients, they are completely aware, so they retain uh, cognitive capacities, um, but they, um, they suffer from a complete paralysis to uh, voluntary muscles, um, so they, they, they cannot display any um, behavioral output except from vertical eye movements. Um, so now the question is, how do we disentangle between these different uh, categories? Um, so in other words, how do we assess consciousness in clinical practice? And so we started from a two-dimensional approach. So basically here you can see altered states of consciousness and DOC uh, placed into this two-dimensional space defined by awareness. Um, that is the content of consciousness and arousal, that is the level of consciousness. So, for example, now I hope that you are all um, very conscious and awake. So you will be here at the top of this of this two dimensional space. If you were um, to be in a comatose state, you would be here. So you will have very low awareness and very low arousal. But then you can have interesting um, dissociations between these two components. For example, if you are in a vegetative state and responsive wakefulness syndrome, you are very well aroused, yet you are unaware. Um, so from this 2D, uh, two-dimensional approach, we transition to a um, multidimensional framework in which um, DOC and related conditions here depicted with these um, with this green rectangles are placed in a three-dimensional space. So usually, um, when we assess consciousness in um, when we assess consciousness in clinical practice, we resort to the coma recovery scale revised, that is uh, currently the gold standard for the behavioral evaluation of these patients, and the CRSR um, assesses both motor functions and overt cognition. So overcognition means cognitive, cognitive, uh, cognitive um, mediated behaviors uh, overtly expressed. So an example could be uh, squeezing the hand, right? So if I ask you to squeeze my hand and you do it, this is an example of overt cognition. So now the problem is if we rely only on, only on a behavioral evaluation of these patients uh, based um, indeed on the CRSR, for example, we risk to miss a lot of awareness. Um, that is patients who are unresponsive, so who are un behaviorally unresponsive, um, yet they are conscious. And we call this covert uh, cognition, so covert awareness. And to detect covert awareness, we need to resort to neuroimaging techniques. So in the next couple of slides, um, I'll focus on, on those. 
Um, so at the moment, we uh, dispose of a wide varieties of neuroimaging techniques that we can employ in clinical practice. Um, one of the most used is, um, is the electroencephalogram. So the EEG, um, so the EEG basically measures the electrical activity of your brain that is captured by electrodes that are placed on the scalp. So as you can see here on the picture, it's non-invasive. And um, one of the most immediate analyses that you can do with the EEG is the visual inspection of the EEG traces, as you can see here on the right, um, to look for um, pathological abnormalities in the signal. Um, then with the EEG, um, probably you know better than me, but there are like a lot of features that you can extract from the EEG signal, a lot of analysis that you can carry out. Um, Evan-related potential is one of the most commonly used because it's relatively easy and doesn't require a lot of technical expertise. And um, basically with this technique, you deliver some stimuli to patients, for example, uh, sounds or vibrations. And then you measure the electrical activity evoked by those stimuli. And then you compare it with healthy controls and you basically might um, make some inferences on the level of consciousness retained by the patient. Um, another technique is functional connectivity in specific frequency bands. Um, so as you know, the EEG signal is composed of different rhythms, so different frequencies, right? So the alpha rhythm, um, the beta, and so on and so forth. So with some uh, mathematical computation, you can extract uh, frequency bands, and then you can compute the functional connectivity within this uh, frequency. So for example, here on the picture on the right on this video, um, you can see the connectivity, the functional connectivity in um, half a band in a DOC patient on the left and a healthy control on the right. And of course, again, you can make inferences, right? Because you can see um, <clears throat> that in the DOC patient, brain region seems to be less interconnected compared to the healthy control on the right. And this technique developed by Chenno and colleagues in 2017 proved to be really a valuable um, diagnostic uh, tool. Um, another approach is machine learning. Um, so as I said, from the EEG, you can extract really a lot of different features. So another way to go is to say, um, okay, I will just select a certain number of features, let's say 26 features. I will just put them in a machine um, learning algorithm and then I will, um, I will, how you say, train the um, the classifier, the the machine learning algorithm on 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 a certain set, and then I will test um, how it classifies patients um, according to the features that I selected. And so maybe we can dig a little bit more on these later on if if you have questions. Um, then another technique is the actually this is one of the most promising uh, diagnostic tool that we currently have to assess consciousness at the bedside is the TMS EEG approach. Um, in particular, the perturbational complexity index. Um, so basically, you um, you perturb the brain by delivering a trans transcranial magnetic stimulation pulse, and then you record the brain response with the EEG. So basically, you have your brain response, and then you will compress the brain, the EEG brain response, um, as you as for example, when you zip a folder in um, in your computer, and then you will get the algorithmic complexity of the response, and this will highlight will yield a certain PCI score. And of course, the higher, it means that the more the brain response was complex, and so the more the patient retains a capacity uh, for consciousness. Um, then another widely employed technique in, in clinical uh, setting is the position emission tomography, so the PET. Um, so basically with the PET, you inject in the veins of the patients um, radioactive glucose, and then the PET will take images of where this, this glucose has been uh, metabolized or has been used. Um, and, and of course, you have the standardized uptake value, so that gives you um, um, an index of the glucose metabolism. So for example, here you see on the right um, the um, contrast between uh, regional glucose metabolism in minimally conscious state minus and minimally conscious state plus patients. Um, so as I said before, um, the, the main difference between these two categories, these 
two subcategories of MCS patients um, lies on the um, on language function. So MCS minus patients do not retain language functions, whereas MCS plus patients do. And here, indeed, you can see that the regional Google metabolism, the Google's metabolism is way higher in MCS plus patients in the uh, left middle temporal lobe that is indeed um, uh, an area um, very important for language. Um, then another technique um, also widely used that probably you, you, you already um, know a lot about is the magnetic magnetic resonance imaging. Um, so the MRI basically um, uses a magnetic field and, and, um, and radio frequency pulses to create images of your brain. Um, you, create, you can create different images of your brain. Um, for example, you can uh, create structural series by using adequate contrast. Um, for example, if you want to um, if you want to see um, if you want to investigate anatomical features of patient's brain and see where uh, lesions um, happened and, and so on and so forth. Um, you can also uh, look at diffusion tensor tensor imaging. Um, you can also take DTI images um, that basically will tell you the um, integrity of um, axonal tracks. And so you can basically see to what extent different brain regions are interconnected. Um, and again, so the, the strategy is always the same. So you compare these images without the controls and um, you make inferences on the level of consciousness, right? Depending on the integrity, for example, of axonal tracks <clears throat> in this case. Um, another technique, um, MRI-based, is the volume-based morphometry. So with this technique, you can quantify the brain volume. So you can quantify gray matter, white matter volume and for example, in this picture, you see that this patient had a widespread um, decrease in, in white matter, and it is also displayed here and compared to control. Um, also, the VBM has, has been validated and is also a very useful tool to disentangle between different categories of DOC. And then we have active functional tasks. So with active functional tasks, you wanna um, you wanna see, let's say, how different regions in your brain, um, in, in your brain and in patient's brain, of course, activate depending on a specific um, active task. So this is a benchmark study that I think you all know about probably. Um, and in this study, they uh, took an, un an unresponsive, um, unresponsive wakefulness syndrome uh, patient. So. Um, at the bedside, and they um, they put it into an MRI scan, and then they asked him to imagine play tennis and to spatially navigate his home. Um, so now we know in healthy controls that, for example, if I would ask to you healthy controls to imagine play tennis, um, we know very well that the supplementary motor area will light up. And if I would ask you to specially navigate your house, we know that another network of areas, so the parahippocampal areas, uh, premotor cortices, and posterior parietal cortices will also activate. So in, in this patient, basically, you can see that you have exactly the same um, activation in response to the tennis imagery and spatial navigation imagery tasks. And so this is a really, I would say, a clear-cut example of covert consciousness because this patient was behaviorally unresponsive at the bedside, yet was um, fully conscious because he was able to engage in such a de cognitively demanding task. Um, then with the MRI, another uh, type of analysis you can do is to look at resting state functional connectivity. Um, so we know that in healthy controls, you, we have different kinds of networks depending on what we do. Um, so for example, if I'm mind wandering or daydreaming, I might have my the so-called default mode network very active. Or if I'm uh, listening to some sounds, uh, I might see the auditory network. So then with this knowledge, we can go, uh, we, we, we can analyze uh, the, the DOC patient's brain and see if they show the same um, networks that in healthy controls or um, we can investigate to what extent they have been uh, damaged. Um, okay, so this was um, a really brief, um, I think, overview on neuroimaging techniques that we uh, currently um, employ in clinical practice to detect covert uh, consciousness and so to assess uh, consciousness in general, um, but now I'd like to give you, as Michele um, said before, some um, more practical, let's say, um, recommendations on how to uh, clinically assess consciousness. So 
I will speak about the EAN uh, recommendation, so the EAN guideline uh, that was updated in 2020. Um, so 16 uh, members um, um, from the EAN, uh, representative 10 different countries, uh, they met and then they revised and examined a lot of scientific literature on how to best assess consciousness in DOC. And then they uh, gave some recommendations that can be strong recommendations or weak or uh, moderate based on uh, weak, moderate or um, strong scientific evidence. Um, so first of all, they recommend to always manually open the patients, uh, the the eyes of the patient in case the in case the patient doesn't open them spontaneously. And this is because, of course, if you want to, for example, perform the CRSR, it is way more effective to have the patient's eyes open so that he can see um, you moving objects or, um, you know, you performing certain kind of exercises. Um, then another one is to always use the mirror to evaluate visual pursuit or fixation. So um, as I, I think anticipated earlier, with the comma recovery scale revised, so with the CRSR, it is a, a scale com that comprises six uh, subscales. And so in each scale, you assess different items. So in long story short, you are kind of doing some exercises with the patient. And one of these exercises is to check for visual pursuit or fix fixation. So it means that I will just place an object again, in front of the, the patient's face, and then I will just move it in, in the four directions, and I will just check that the patient is actually following it with his eyes or her, her eyes. And uh, studies have, have shown that if you use a mirror, you get more, um, is more effective. So you get more responses from uh, DOC patients compared to uh, just a ball or another uh, common object. Um, then another recommendation is um, to always use the um, the four um, instead of the Glasgow coma scale, um, because so as I already said, the CRSR is the gold standard for um, clinical consciousness assessment. Yet sometimes it might be not feasible uh, because of different constraints. For example, in the intensive care unit, um, you might have time limits, and the CRSR takes up to 30, 40 minutes. Uh, to be performed entirely, um, or also other constraints like sedation and so on and so forth. So before uh, in the ICU, we were using the Glasgow Coma Scale, but then the EAN indeed rec strongly recommend uh, recommended the uh, four. Um, then the CRSR, of course, I mean, as already said, is strongly recommended every in every case um, where is possible. Uh, because the CRSR was uh, specifically designed to detect subtle uh, behavioral signs of awareness. Um, and the EAN recommends to um, never base your uh, diagnosis, or so never, let's say, make a final diag diagnosis based only on one CRSR assessment, but always, um, always repeat the CRSR at least more than once before uh, making a strong diagnosis. Um, and then of course, as Michele already, um, already said, we need to integrate behavioral assessment to complement behavioral assessment with uh, neuroimaging technique based evaluation of consciousness. So the EAN here recommends to use active fMRI paradigm. So the one that I, um, that I described before. So for example, imagine play tennis or imagine to specially navigate your house. Um, also some resting state fMRI paradigms and then to quantify brain metabolism using PET that also seems a valid, um, a valid tool in the diagnosis of DOC. Um, okay, so some final recommendations. Um, they also recommend to always visually inspect the EEG traces, uh, so to look again for pathological abnormalities, and you can also look, for example, at the um, background organization or um, or the reactivity to stimuli of these EEG traces, or also to um, if there are like some sleep elements, you know, so some sleep structure elements present in there. Um, also to record EEG when patients are sleeping to check whether, um, you know, uh, sleep stages are alternating as in healthy controls or what kind of modifications there are. Um, you know, you can check for K-complexes and spindles as, as depicted here. Um, and, but this is like weekly uh, recommended, but still. 
Um, and then um, some final recommendations to use the perturbational complexity index to differentiate between um, UWS patients and minimally conscious state patients. Uh, so the, the PCI has been validated in a wide cohort of DOC patients and has shown um, really good specificity and sensitivity. And then a final recommendation is also to consider quantitative high density EG. So it just means analyze EEG data and extracting some um, measures of um, power, connectivity, signal complexity, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so the behavioral assessment, as I said, the CRSR is currently the gold standard for the clinical evaluation of consciousness in DOC. Um, but as I, as I said before, it's really time consuming because it, it can take up to 30, 40 minutes to be performed. And also it takes a lot of uh, training. So in um, so we developed this um, shorter and faster scale, the simplified evaluation of consciousness disorders, the seconds. So the seconds can be performed in just seven minutes and um, has been um, um, has been um, subjected to a first round of validation uh, in DOC and showed sensitivity and specificity comparable to the CRSR and also very good intra and inter um, reliability. So. Um, so that could be indeed a uh, future direction. So to employ the seconds in clinical settings, specifically in the ICU where um, time limits um, are specifically, um, well. Um, and then, so then some, some evidence um, is gathering at the moment on, um, on other behavioral signs of consciousness, so meaning um, other behavior that might signal the entry into a consciousness state, so that it might signal uh, the presence of consciousness. And uh, for example, resistance to eye opening has been shown to be a good to correlate pretty well with levels of consciousness. So if the patient uh, resists when you try to open his or her eyes, well, this is a good sign that the patient might be conscious, Another one is uh, grimaces or leg crossing or um, sound localization and um, blinking to visual threat, for example, has been shown to, to do not correlate um, with consciousness that much because UWS patients, they uh, blink to visual threat and they are unaware. Um, so has been concluded that is not really a good sign of consciousness. Uh, but of course, I mean, all of this has to be taken, I guess, with a with a with a little bit of precaution because few studies have been conducted on these um, behavioral signs of consciousness. So we have to wait um, a little bit more um, before drawing any conclusion. Um, so then, regarding the neuroimaging assessment, so what's next? So as I already said, and as Michele already stressed. Um, um, and also the EAN, um, we need to complement the behavioral evaluation with a, with a neuroimaging-based one. Um, in this study, we um, combined PET and EEG with the behavioral evaluation, and we were able to show that 68% of um, UWS patients, so mm, behaviorally unresponsive patients diagnosed as such at the bedside using the CRSR, presented um, brain activity comparable to the one found in minimally conscious state patients. So I think the, this, this, um, this study really, um, really makes a point, and the point is indeed the ethical relevance of covert consciousness uh, because of the consequences it has on um, end-of-life decisions and um, withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment and, and so on and so forth. So yeah, and that I guess brings us to an end. So yeah, I'd like to thank you a lot for your attention your and your time and um, thank you. Thank you very much Data, for this wonderful overview and very also analytical uh, analysis of the clinical issues surrounding the uh, assessment of residual consciousness and disorders of consciousness. So we have provided you uh, quite a wide, so to say, a general analysis of ethical topics surrounding uh, disorders of consciousness. Also, we have referred to the main clinical uh, discussion around them, how to improve the diagnosis of residual consciousness in this subject. There are a number of techniques and approaches that can be used 
two basic families, so to say, behavioral and instrumental assessment within the instrumental, but also within, of course, the behavioral assessment. Uh, there are different possible uh, some approaches, so to say, um, and there are different issues arising. So I thank Benedetta again for her kindness and very nice and uh, useful uh, lecture about the clinical assessment of disorders of consciousness. I thank you all for your participation and yeah, stay tuned. Thank you.